In this lesson, we will look at the photons and electrons section of the physics syllabus. Now, when we look at the section, we look at the photoelectric effect, which is the evidence of the particle nature of light. So firstly, we need to understand the metallic model. So we have positive kernels, metal kernels, which are surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons indicated by our negative charges over here and our positive kernels over here. Now, although the electrons are delocalized, as we can see, they are still held by the positive kernels. So what actually happens is you have your positive kernels surrounded by electrons and those electrons float around as they are attracted by different positive kernels at different points in time. And that causes them to become delocalized in your metallic model. Now, to remove these electrons, work must be done on the electron. When the work is done in the form of light energy, so if we, if we sh uh, shine a light onto our metal, um, we do work on the electrons. And in the form of light energy, the process of removal of the electron is known as photoelectric emission. So light energy or light carries energy and gives electrons energy, which leads to photoelectric emission. So when we look at frequency, our F is, is the symbol for frequency and our symbol over here is for wavelength. When we look at high frequency, we look at gamma, X-ray and UV light, which have high frequency and high energy. Our mid energy, mid frequency and mid wavelength are the visible spectrum, what we can see, and a large wavelength and short frequency are infrareds, radio waves and microwaves, which are low energy. That's just useful to know and know how our frequency interacts with our wavelength. Then we look at a demonstration. So if we have a plate of zinc metal and we shine a high intensity red light onto that metal, we have less electrons and therefore lower leaf because we have lost electrons from our metal. The infrared has a lower frequency and therefore less energy and a low leaf. Whereas if we look at a low intensity UV light, we have a zinc plate of metal as shown here. Our leaf is higher because we have more electrons. The UV has a higher frequency as, we, as was shown in the table above and more energy and therefore a higher leaf. So as we can see over here, the photon or energy parcel that is released by the light shines onto the metal, gives the electrons in the metal energy, the electrons in the metal come to the surface and they are released in photoelectric emission. Now, if we have a quantum of electromagnetic radiation, that is simply the amount of light energy in a wave. A photon, when we refer to a photon, a photon is simply a package of light and a quantum of electromagnetic, radi electromagnetic radiation is also called a photon. So photoelectric emission takes place immediately. We must know that there is no time delay when photoelectric emission takes place. It takes place immediately and the electrons are released. There is no delay between the incoming electromagnetic radiation and electron emission. Our photons cannot be divided. So a photon gives all its energy to one electron. So when a photon of light or a package of light comes onto our metal, the energy cannot be divided to a number of le electrons. It will simply be given to one electron leading to photoelectric emission if that takes place. Our electron is only emitted if the frequency is above the threshold frequency of the metal, which is dependent on the type of metal as we will see now. And the energy of the photon is directly proportional to the frequency of electromagnetic radiation. So when you look at the energy of a photon, we have the formula E energy equals H, which is Planck's constant, which is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 34 times F, which is the frequency of our light. Now, in order to work out our frequency, we've got a number of equations over here. Our frequency is equal to Planck's constant over our wavelength. And we can then link that back to our energy of our photon. And in the same way, we can rearrange these to get our energy over our H equals Planck's constant over 
our wavelength. And then we can get that our energy of our photon is equal to Planck's constant times, sorry, is equal to the constant speed of light, which is three times 10 to the eight times Planck's constant over our wavelength. And if we look at the speed of light, which is our wave equation, could this is referred to as our wave equation. We have C is our constant, our speed of light, three times 10 to the eight. We have our wavelength. So our constant speed of light equals our wavelength times our frequency. And we can use this to solve for the frequency or the wavelength of our waves or our energy packages. When we look at threshold frequency and the work function, our work function energy, which will be referred to a lot, is the amount of energy required to allow an electron to escape. It is the minimum amount of energy that you need in order for an electron to be emitted from a metal. So your work function energy, which is E, is equal to Planck's constant, which is found on your formula sheet, times your threshold frequency. Now your threshold frequency is different for each metal and we will learn how to solve for that coming up. The energy of the incident electromagnetic energy is all transferred to the electron. Part of the energy is used to release the electron. So a certain amount will be used to release the electron from the metal, from the bond, and the rest is transferred to kinetic energy. So the rest of the energy that is left from the photon that is not used to break the bond and release the electron is then transferred to kinetic energy and that determines how fast the electron leaves the, the metal. So when we look at photon energy, it's simply our work function, which is the amount of energy used to release the electron, plus our max EK, which is our kinetic energy of the electron. So the full photon package of energy is divided into our work function, the amount used to release the electron, plus our EK, which is the speed or the amount of energy that it has when it moves off. So HF, this is now photon energy from our equation above where we had our photon energy above and we now have HF equals HF naught, which is our work energy. As we see here, our work energy is HF naught plus our max EK, which is simply half MV squared from our kinetic energy formula. Or this can be translated to H times C over wavelength because we know that E is equal to H times C over our wavelength. And we move on to the photoelectric effect. Now, when they made predictions, they made predictions based on wave theory. They predicted that electrons should be emitted for any frequency of light after a delay during which electrons gained enough energy to escape from the metal. And they predicted that high intensities of electrons absorbed more energy and therefore should have higher EK or kinetic energy. Now these predictions were both wrong and the actual observations which became true are if the frequency is above the threshold frequency, your electrons are emitted instantaneously and below your threshold frequency, no electrons are emitted. So if you have a metal that has an, an a threshold frequency and your light is above that threshold frequency, you will have an immediate um, emission of electrons. And if the frequency is below your threshold frequency, there will be no emission of electrons. If you are above your threshold frequency, the number of electrons emitted per second is directly proportional to the intensity of light. So by this, we are saying if you increase your intensity of your light, you increase the number of photons per second and one photon emits one electron. Therefore, we can say that more electrons are emitted with a higher, higher intensity light. We look at kinetic energy of the emitted electron varies from zero to maximum value, which depends on the frequency of the light and not the intensity of the light. So if we look at a graph like this, we have sodium and we have aluminum. Now the gradient of these graphs is your H, which is your Planck's constant. You're plotting your kinetic energy against your frequency. 
your y intercept in this graph is simply your work function which is the minimum amount of energy required to emit the electron now we can see that your na has a lower y-intercept or a more positive y-intercept so and our aluminium has a more negative y-intercept so we know that we're going to need more energy to release an electron from aluminium and this is because aluminium has a higher charge it holds onto its electrons with more force and therefore a higher work function or amount of energy is required to move your electrons from your aluminium so you may be given a graph such as this in an exam or test where you'll be asked to explain how this works and you'd simply refer to your y-intercept as your y as your work function and your gradient as Planck's constant and your frequency plotted against your kinetic energy which you get from hf equals your work function plus ek which you solve into a y equals mx plus c equation when you look at units of energy, we measure our energy in joules with the capital J symbol. An electrovolt, an electron volt, sorry, isn't we use the symbol EV, and one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Now you must remember to always convert your electron volts to joules when you're doing calculations. You may be given your values in electron volts, and you must know to transfer that or um, calculate that in joules before you do your calculations so one electron volt is the amount of kinetic energy gained by a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 accelerated through a potential difference of one volt now that's not that important to know but it is interesting to know where we get the electron volt from now this is not does not form part of the syllabus but it is useful to know we look at the wave nature of light we have diffraction and interference so we, this is our evidence of the wave nature of light we have diffraction through openings and around objects so light travels as a wave we have a wave and if we have another wave which forms a constructive interference we have a wave which is simply double that of the first if we have deconstructive interference we have two waves which cancel through their crests and their troughs and we form no wave which is known as deconstructive interference now that is not important to know for the syllabus it does not form part of the syllabus but it is just interesting to know the wave nature of light when we look at the emission spectra we know when an element is heated strongly or when a gas at a low pressure is subjected to high potential difference the element glows it emits energy in the visible region so electrons absorb exact amounts of energy and become excited and are promoted to higher energy levels. When the electrons revert to lower energy states, they lose energy by emitting photons whose energy corresponds to the energy loss. So if we look at two energy states of an electron, we have E2 and we have E1. When an electron drops from our second state over here to our first state over here, it releases a photon. Of energy which is calculated by HF as we know the, the energy of a photon is calculated by HF and therefore light is emitted when we go E2 minus E1 to work out our change in our energy that is equal to HF which is equal to H times C our constant speed of light over our wavelength when we look at the energy lost by electrons it produces atomic emission spectrum so if you look at level 2 and level 1 if a, an electron were to drop from level 2 to level 1 as we can see it would release a photon and therefore light if it were to drop from level 3 to level 1 light would be emitted, emitted but it is different color due to more energy so more energy would be released in this jump because it's across two levels then we would be released in this jump and therefore this drop in energy would produce a different color in the visible spectrum to this drop in energy over here and in the same way our drop from level three to level two would produce a different color 
and drop from level two to level one would produce the same color as this drop over here. And it is good to know that one photon is released per drop. So one full package of light is released per drop in energy levels. So then we have a more complex electron configuration of atom will lead to more complex spectrum. So it would obviously produce a more complex spectrum like this. So when we look at our drop from three to, to one, we have our spectrum over here. And when we have a drop from two to one, we have a spectrum over here. And our drop from three to two is off the spectrum in this case. And they will often ask you to work out your wavelength or your frequency or the energy released given cases such as these ones suggested here, but they will give you values for each level and or they may give you the frequency or the wavelength and you will be asked to calculate for the unknown. But please keep a lookout on our page for our practical workings and going through examples and we will definitely be sure to go through an example of and of this nature. So it's also important to know every element has its own distinctive emission spectrum and that is how scientists are able to identify what objects and substances are made up of because we can identify the emission spectrum of an element and therefore identify what we are dealing with. This is used when when astronomers look at stars and we try and identify what they are made up of, we use emission spectra to identify the elements. Now looking at the absorption spectrum, this does not form part of the syllabus, but it is quite cool to know if you're interested in your physics. You have an atom with a nucleus and your electrons can be anywhere in the orbital, as we know. So if an electron moves out, it is ionized. So electrons can only occur at exact energy levels. If you have an electron at, at your energy level one and you give it exactly five electron volts, it will jump up to energy level two and so on. It will move between energy levels. And if it is now given enough energy to move on out of the energy levels, so moves past your infinite levels, then your applied energy, your electron will move out and it will become ionized. As I said, that's not important to know for the syllabus, but it is interesting. Then just a quick recap. So if we have a light source and photons are delivered to a metal with electrons, say our photon has 500 joules of energy, that whole photon will be given to one electron. Enough energy will be used if if the frequency is above the threshold frequency of the metal, energy will be given to the electron. The amount of energy that is needed to leave the metal will be used and the rest will be transformed into kinetic energy for the electron to move off. The energy of a photon or light is calculated as E equals H being Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. And the required energy for a metal or the work function, the, the minimum amount of energy required for the electron to move off is calculated by E equals H times the threshold frequency, which is the lowest frequency that we need in order for the electron to be emitted. And it's good to know if you're given the wavelength of light, you can use your constant C, your, your speed of light equals your frequency times your wavelength. And you can sub that in to this equation over here and get that your energy is equal to your H, which is Planck's constant times the speed of light over your wavelength. And then it's good to know if your energy of your light is equal to your work function, you will have an emission of an electron. If your energy of your light is less than your work function, nothing will happen. And if your energy of your light is greater than your work function, there will be an emission of the electron and the electron will leave with kinetic energy.